Hello, once again, here we are in CU Immigration TV. My name is Ricardo Diaz, and I'm here to bring you another interesting show on the subject of immigration. And in this case, it's part of a series in which we'll be talking about immigrant-friendly communities. Uh, and for that, we have a couple of guests that are here to tell us about that. Can you please tell us about yourselves? Introduce yourselves. Sure, I'm Deirdre Laniscog. I've lived in Champaign-Urbana for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. I'm Jessica Kurzman. Uh, I'm a first year master's student in urban planning at the university, and I'm from Detroit, Michigan. Excellent. And you are both students here at the U of I? We are. We are. Yes. Tell us a little bit about your program and then tell us how you came to this subject. Sure. Um, so, in urban planning, uh, I am concentrating in community development for social justice and took a class with Stacey Harwood, um, who's been on the show. Uh, called Local Immigration Policy, and I'm in the class with Deirdre. I'm actually um, not an urban planning student. I come from the School of Social Work. I'm a doctoral student in the School of Social Work, um, but was really interested in this class, which studies local immigration policy and the response of communities to new immigrant populations. And you've been involved in this topic, because we've now, I've now seen you almost everywhere immigration comes up, you've been there. I have. I've been watching campus. for quite a while. Yes. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So tell us about the course and then how we come to today's subjects. Sure. So the course uh, decided to look at local immigration policy from the uh, strategy of uh, immigrant-friendly communities rather than trying to combat some of the more divisive strategies that have been used um, to separate families and uh, kind of create anti-immigration tactics. So we were coming at it from a component of making communities stronger and more immigrant friendly. Um, so we researched some strategies that are helpful uh, for local policymakers and service providers um, in establishing a more immigrant friendly community. So what are the range of subjects that you studied as a class that you covered? So we studied things like um, ways cities and communities can uh, help immigrants um, develop businesses and uh, create some economic impact. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about ways um, communities can welcome immigrants using immigrant welcome centers. Um, in another segment, our colleague Billy will talk to you about that. Mm -hmm. um, and today, um, the topic I just I researched for this class was the use of promotoris, which are sort of uh, community helpers who go out into the community and help form a bridge between um, immigrant communities and the institutions who intend to serve them. Okay, can we show some slides on that? So, uh, here we go. Are we up there? Okay. So, Promotoris de Salud, as they're usually called, are, uh, are community volunteers who are trained to provide uh, health education to their peers, to their neighbors, to their friends and family, and to serve as a bridge between community members and formal health care institutions. They're traditionally used in Latin American countries, so they're very familiar to Latino immigrants to the United States. And so, uh, this this sort of idea, this concept has been adapted by local institutions and local governments in the U.S. as a way to reach out um, and build relationships with new Latino communities. It seems to me, I was thinking about the, the, the term promotoras, to promote, um, and then I think, well, what do other agencies do? You know, let's say other populations, and I kept thinking, I see now the term outreach mm -hmm. director, outreach, you know, seems to come up quite a bit now. I didn't, I don't remember seeing it 10 years ago quite a bit right. or as much. Concepts like outreach or like liaisons. Mm -hmm. um, agencies will have liaisons to go out into a certain community. They're all working on the same concept of going out into the community rather than waiting for people to come into the building or mm -hmm. come into the institution. So why would you, why wouldn't people come in and thus the need from a promotora? Well, if we go to the next slide, I can talk to you a little bit about that. There are a number of reasons um, why uh, immigrants in particular um, would be reluctant to go into American institutions. First of all, just being unfamiliar with the ways that schools work or hospitals work or mm -hmm. local government works. Um, second of all, there's some fear very often uh, fear of repercussions based on maybe um, undocumented status or fear that immigrants aren't eligible for many of the programs that these institutions provide, when mm -hmm. in many cases they are. Mm -hmm. I know that one thing that confuses me still is under the name, under one name, 
I have to go to a clinic, to a hospital, to North Tower, to South Tower, but they all have the same name. Mm -hmm. And so now I don't know when, where I'm calling when I'm calling mm -hmm. because they tend to answer depending on what their subdivisions are. So it confuses me and I'm local enough. So. Right, right. And then just the issue of language that um, especially in areas with new immigrant populations, the institutions may not have a staff member who speaks the language of the immigrant mm -hmm. who's able to really serve as a bridge mm -hmm. um, to help the immigrant find the services that they need. Yeah. I, although I did notice, I went to the ortho last week and there was a language card there mm -hmm. and I hadn't seen one in, in, in at least in my regular clinic and I could pick my language if I needed to. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the procedure is, but it was nice that somebody could link me up. Uh, but in this case, for, with, with promotoras, what, where, where did this originate and how, how, do, how do, is it implemented? Do I, I think that by now there's, there's some experience in different places diff do it different ways. There are. Uh, there's some really neat examples of ways um, American communities, American institutions have adapted this very Latin American concept of mm -hmm. promotoris. And if we go up to pull to the next slide, um, one example in particular, um, just east of Los Angeles in California, there's a large valley called the San Gabriel Valley. It's a very densely populated valley nestled between the mountains and the ocean. And um, if we go to the next slide, you'll see, uh, we can pull up this website here. Um, there's a consortium of healthcare providers in, uh, in the San Gabriel Valley who realized that their Latino residents, their Latino clients in particular, were not enrolling in public health insurance programs for which they were eligible. And so this consortium of healthcare providers banded together with the public health agencies in California. Keep, keep going. Keep and, going. I mean, I'll pull it up in just a minute. And, and they came up with the idea to, to to recruit women volunteers to go door to door in Latino neighborhoods and help families sign up for the public health insurance programs for which they were already eligible. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to give you an idea of the impact of this program, over the course of seven years, they were able to recruit, uh, they were able to enroll 30,000 residents in public health insurance programs. Now that benefits the, the clients who are enrolled and that they have better access to health programs. It benefits the health care providers and that they're able to um, submit reimbursement for those the care they provide to those clients and it benefits the community by having a, a healthier population a healthier community mm -hmm. um, and where how does that transfer to us so that's a pretty large project a really big ambitious project um, with an with a big group of partners um, however here we could use that idea on a very smaller scale uh, to combat some of the, the, the local access issues that immigrants find. For example, um, some of the, our local school districts are already hiring professionals to serve as liaisons to immigrant communities. So for example, several of the school districts have what they call a Latino parent liaison. Now this is a professional worker, not a volunteer. But um, at the same time, that same model could be used with beyond the school, beyond the school district. So, for example, the immigration forum, the local uh, immigrant advocacy group, recruited volunteers, lay people, um, to receive training about DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, mm -hmm. and then to go out into the community and provide training for community members, for family members, and for youth who wanted to apply for that program. Mm -hmm. And in that case we had one, two, three trainings. Yes. So th th those people came in basically one session learn how to deal with this change of policy and mm -hmm. then were able to then be volunteers at the sessions that we had for the public. Mm -hmm. Would the promotoras have that kind of, uh, in this case it was one training or, or how would you differ that, or, or is it a deeper, just more training, or? Well, the great thing about promotoris is that they're really adaptable to any kind of situation. So I could foresee, for example, um, 
agencies that might have a, a short-term or a more immediate-term need using Promotorus to get out information about some sort of process that's coming. For example, um, the availability of driver's license now for undocumented immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, those of us who grew up in the U.S. remember going through this process as 16-year-olds with parents to, and a driver's training instructor to help us navigate getting a mm -hmm. driver's license. Yeah. So now we have a, a large group of adults who need to know how to manage that process. Mm -hmm. And Promotorus could easily be trained to help people understand what they need to prepare ahead of time, what that process will be like. Mm -hmm. And in our case, in, in, at the CU Immigration Forum, we've had that discussion then. The new law kicks in in November. Mm -hmm. uh, several members of the group are learning how, how the law will be implemented and then at that point have the, the knowledge reserve then to to spread it, to, to invite uh, volunteers to come learn. Sure. So um, I'm, I'm trying to think as to the motivation for people to come out and, and be uh, uh, promotores, promotoras. Uh, how has that worked in other places? Well, in other places, promotoras typically come from the community you're trying to serve. So in the case of the work the Immigration Forum did with the DACA trainings, um, the promotorists were people f not necessarily who needed to fill out the DACA forms. Yeah. Um, but in many cases, institutions reach out to the community they're trying to serve. And there's a dual purpose. First of all, um, it helps to build a bridge between the community and the institution. But what we end up find, finding is that those um, women or men who sign up to be promotorists end up emerging as leaders in their own communities. They end up moving on to, um, to even more intense roles in the yeah. community at the institutions they're working with. And which is, in, in, in our case, in, at Immigration Forum, that's one of our advantages, we start seeing the same people coming out, stepping up for mm -hmm. learning about the new subject. And therefore then they, they, they build their own base of, of knowledge uh, such that in a way the CU Immigration Forum then becomes their the monthly checkup with each other rather than implementing new information. It's really a neat way to tap into existing leaders in the community who maybe um, haven't been identified through mm -hmm. other ways or haven't felt comfortable raising their hand and saying, here I am, I'd like to serve. Mm -hmm. And I can see therefore that then the, the one thing that, that most people don't realize is that the civic service, the, the, the not-for-profit work, there are plenty of people to help each other across the world. But mm -hmm. here in the U.S. We, we, we have a system of, I, I, I once had this Latin American uh, uh, friend that that worked with promotores, as he said, it's very interesting. The, in the U.S., you guys have a, a problem. If you have a problem, then you write up, write you write it up, and you go get money, and then you go solve it. Mm -hmm. Whereas back home, and he was speaking, I think of Peru at this time. He said, "We have a problem. We start solving it, and once we're going, then we go and see if we can get more funding to 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 close it up." Mm -hmm. And I and I had never thought of that. We it's very natural for us to go write up a grant, you know, right. and put in hypothetical how we're going to solve it. Right. Mm -hmm. But we haven't yet started rolling it out necessarily. Right. In 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 this case, then I'm I'm thinking for promotores, for, for uh, promotoras, uh, that's a big shift for people that come in from another culture as to how to solve problems. They they need mm -hmm. to acquire that vision to us to how how not-for-profits are organized to, to serve the community. So anyway, one more thing to, to put forward. Um, we are at CU Immigration Forum. We are today talking about uh, how to make our area, or how do communities make themselves more immigrant friendly. And we have two guests from the University of Illinois, a course in immigrant, what's in the title of the course? Local Immigration Policy. Local Immigration Policy. And Deidre has just told us about promotores, promotoras. And now Jessica is going to tell us about uh, the specialty, the, the, the sub area that she's worked on. Sure. So I very much wanted to look at a political integration st strategy. So um, I looked at local immigrant voting rights. Here we are. So um, I, on my second slide, uh, I talk about the history of immigrant voting rights, and while I was researching the strategy, one organizer who worked on one of these campaigns in the United States remarked that 
um, immigrant voting rights in the United States are as American as apple pie and baseball. Um, it's been around since 1776 and it was around for 150 years um, of U.S. history until around 1926. Um, Jessica, I have to ask you this question because I, I think most people will gloss over it. Sure. Immigrants had voting rights. That's correct. They voted. They voted in non over... Non-citizens. Non-citizens. Okay. In over 22 states and territories. Um, and this is really not a foreign concept to the United States, nor is it to other countries, which I'll get into a little bit later, because um, this is worldwide something that's very common. Um, so, uh, to clarify what immigrant voting rights are today, um, there's basically two sets. There's municipal voting rights in voting in citywide elections, and there's school board elections. Um, some cities right now allow both. Some cities uh, have a binary, it's one or the other. Um, so, I have a slide talking about all of the contemporary movements in the United States today. So, um, as you can see, there's quite a lot of cities. Um, that have uh, put their their name in in the ring to try to establish this, and some have been very successful. Um, a few that I'd like to highlight: uh, there's around six cities in Maryland right now um, that allow uh, immigrants, non-citizens, and uh, also non-legal non-citizens. Um, legal, I'm using the uh, common talk that hopefully will be replaced soon. Um, what you mean is people that don't have a current visa status. Yes, that okay. don't have current visa status. Um, and what they've seen in some of these cities in Maryland is uh, actually immigrant communities have a larger turnout at the polls um, than, uh, than non-immigrant communities. So uh, that's very interesting. I think it shows... Um, uh, it's a good. It's a good sign. It's definitely a good way to argue for a strategy like this. Um, it, so, excuse me. So, in Maryland, in in certain cities, mm -hmm. uh, which kind of voting is going on? You mentioned school board. You mentioned city or local elections. Uh, city elections in Maryland. Um, some cities. This is both school board elections and city elections. But nearly all the cities in Maryland right now, um, it's city elections. Uh, immigrants are allowed to vote. Um, Another city that I'd like to highlight is Chicago. Um, since 1988, Chicago has allowed uh, immigrants to vote in school board elections. So this is something that's very commonplace in Chicago and is not new or cutting edge at all because it's been around for so long. Mm -hmm. um, in several other cities uh, on this list, they don't necessarily have uh, a law in place or an ordinance right now that allows a local immigrant uh, voting rights, but it's being worked on. It's something that's been proposed, and it's something that there's been campaigns that are organizing around it. I think previously, when I talked to you about this, it seemed like it was a uh, for cities that don't have it going on, or that might have had it, but mm -hmm. now uh, have uh, that they don't they don't have it. Why did it? You know, if it used to be so commonplace, why doesn't it, it exist now, and we have to start from scratch? Well, when most of these ordinances were erased uh, in 1926, um, and another thing that I'd like to point out is the U.S. Constitution, there's nothing barring local immigrant voting rights, just to make sure that uh, everyone watching is clear on that. It's, the Constitution leaves it up to states and municipalities to allow uh, whether this can occur. Um, and I think a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment has rolled back a lot of the ordinances that were allowed um, until 1926, and the reason why this is uh, being put back on the table is an issue that, and a problem that needs to be solved, is because there are immigrants that need to have a voice, they need to have a political voice, and there needs to be a democratic process um, in order to voice your vote. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, some would say they were important here, they shouldn't have a voice. Yeah, and that's another really interesting uh, topic looking at that in terms of the United States versus a lot of other countries. So on my next slide, I have um, all of the other countries across the world allow immigrants to vote in local elections. Um, so I think to Americans, uh, citizenship is something that should precede voting, but in many other parts in the world, that's not the case. Um, many other countries and cities in the United States see it as if there are people here and they are participating in the local economy, in the schools, and their children, and, every, and, and they, are, they are a person in the city, then they should have a, a voice. They're contributing, and 
they should be heard. So um, in many other countries are on board with this, as you can see, all members of the European Union, over 22 countries in, in the world, um, allow local immigrant voting rights. Mm -hmm. In a way, it does make sense. If everyone is a resident of the city, then everyone should work to fix the problem or to choose the representatives that would fix the problems mm -hmm. or the services that might be going on. Yeah, and I mean, there's a lot of benefits to voting. Um, on my next slide, uh, as you can see, your, vo your vote is your voice. So why would we silence, um, you know, why would we silence anyone's voice? And, and this is very much looked at as a human rights issue in other places uh, around the world. Not so much in the United States, but I, I think also another way to look at this is all of the benefits of voting. Um, there's community concerns that are addressed through voting um, that a lot of immigrants don't have the opportunity to voice right now because they, do, they don't have a say in the local election. Um, and to go on that, there are other uh, populations that benefit from this as well, other populations that are, you know, have the same concerns as some immigrant populations. They have more representation at the polls. And that's another, that's another big point is you can have better representation when you're able to vote in um, who you want to vote in. Uh, and, and that kind of spirals off a lot of other benefits in health and safety and crime when you have people that understand what the issues are and are able to speak to them. Mm -hmm. Good. So I just have a slide here uh, for further resources. Um, if anyone watching would like to learn more about this topic, um, the Immigrant Voting Project is uh, basically an online compendium of um, all of the different contemporary movements in the United States and a little bit more about the history. Um, and I believe there are also links on that site that can link you to um, other movements around the world. Mm -hmm. This is very interesting, and I think at the Immigration Forum, we, we have uh, begun to talk about the, the, the long range. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we very consciously in our mission put down as our first uh, 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 base is to, to highlight the contributions of, of immigrants in, into our towns and then to engage them in, in the civic society. Uh, this goes right along with it, and I think it makes so much sense, but we, we seem to put it off during, I don't know, the negativity of debates, the negativity of, 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 of uh, the last, let's say, 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say, though, to people that say, you know, we'll get to it. There's, we, we got problems. We got immigration reform to take care of. Well, as you, as you know, Ricardo, uh, immigration reform, that's another thing that people would say is we'll get to it. And... That's not something that can be said. There are people here, there are people who are now, and their voices need to be represented. Um, it's, it's a crime not to. Uh, another thing that I'd like to point out is uh, political integration, this whole strategy is, is a way, it's a pathway to citizenship itself, to getting people involved in, in, in local issues. Mm -hmm. um, and that has been pointed out in, in other countries across the world that this is one of the steps and to helping politically integrate uh, all members of society. Mm -hmm. I think you bring up a good point. We do have a lot of problems. We have a lot on our plate. Um, and I think in some regard, we, we forget that immigrants have a lot to offer, that they're entrepreneurial. They bring a richness, a diversity to our communities. And that um, by including them in our processes, in our institutions, we increase the number of people who are available to help solve those problems that we have. Well, and we come back then to, to the civic engagement uh, uh, of, of promotoras. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If they come from the community and they already know, I, I, I think of, of one that is now officially a promotora, but for years she was just one of the people that people, that, mm -hmm. that, that neighbors went to get help from. Mm -hmm. And eventually she was identified by the local clinic, one of the clinics, mm -hmm. and now she's learned all these neat things. Mm -hmm. I, I, I find it funny because she's put her, pla her, her place on, her, uh, herself on Facebook, and she now regularly finds really neat things. She was explaining mm -hmm. the circulatory system to me one day, mm -hmm. and I was like, this girl had, you know, barely finished elementary school. Right. But now as she's discovering this, and, mm -hmm. and then the, she was working on a heart disease, and in order for that to, mm -hmm. to happen, she had to learn the other parts, and she was explaining them with such uh, a thrill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, many communities and our community, without a doubt, um, we have untapped leaders, untapped potential 
in our immigrant groups mm -hmm. and um, finding ways to connect with them, to help them reach their potential, to help them grow as future American citizens is really important. And it's smart for all of us. Yeah, and I think it's something that some cities are slower to react than others. Um, and cities need help. They need leaders to help show them what the problems are. Uh, because at times, a lot of political leaders need a little push in that direction. And um, I think that there is a real nexus between promotoras and um, local voting rights. Because when you have local voting rights and you have more representation, you're can easier identify problems, especially in health and other civic types of infrastructure. Problems and solutions. Problems and solutions, exactly. And, and now, let me move to, because we, we seem to talk sometimes about immigrants as if it were uh, both on, on the, the poor or the uneducated, and yet, I don't know what the percentage is of doctors in our systems, but uh, nationwide, a quarter of uh, of the medical field, especially with the degree of doctors, mm -hmm. are actually foreign born. Mm -hmm. In our area, I have noticed, I think I've had one American born, well, no, I, all, I now have a dentist that's local. I mm -hmm. mean, that's, that's uh, maybe even local as in born here. But mm -hmm. for, for the last 10 years, most of my doctors have been uh, Nigerian, mm -hmm. Indian. Um, I had a Latin American for a little period. And I, and I wonder, their contributions too, I don't know whether they're citizens or not, but certainly uh, their residents, their yeah. education, their mm -hmm. contribution to, to our system would certainly be welcome, mm -hmm. besides their wages and their That's medical right. help, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. So tell me where, uh, where the class goes from here. Uh, you, you've been researching these topics for a little bit, and then uh, we'll have other people in, 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 in the next few uh, segments. Uh, what do you do with this, and how do you plan to incorporate into your own education or to your own degree? Well, I'm hoping to do my master's project around this next year. Um, my program's very short. It's just two years, and hoping to continue to expand on these topics and see how um, even more strategies can be integrated into uh, community plans and city plans. Okay. And I don't know what degree you're in. I'm, I'm getting a PhD, and I'm really interested in the way social service and human service organizations adapt their services to meet the needs of new immigrant populations. Mm -hmm. I think that in our, in our county, we have had, at least my, my work in, in this area has been uh, uh, frequent contact with, with Champaign mm -hmm. uh, uh, County Health. So, well, it seems like we've run out of time, and it's, be, it, it's just been wonderful to learn about the positive and to how to do it better. So I thank you very much for coming to uh, this space, and we'd like to thank the public for listening to uh, listening and watching at CU Immigration Forum TV. Thank you. Until next time. Thank you. Thank you.